all of a sudden, just in that moment, everything just slowed down. The hardest fighting fish I've caught is I caught like a 54 inch bull red in Venice, Louisiana. That I saw the most amazing thing today. I have to somehow find a way to do that every day. Ended up jumping off the boat in the swamp, you know, trying to get a fish and the guy, I, I didn't know I was inexperienced and the guy was like, don't get off the boat. There are way cooler fish, there are way more badass fish, there are way more rewarding fish, but for me, it's always gonna be steelhead. Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Welcome back to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors. I'm Russell, and unfortunately today, Jose will not be joining us again as he's still out in the field for work. But today we have a very special guest who is sure to inspire and enlighten us all with her incredible journey and profound knowledge of the sport of fly fishing. We're absolutely thrilled to have a renowned angler, conservationist, part-time guide, and leading figure in the world of fly fishing. Welcome, April Vokey. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing today, April? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited for this episode. And I know Jose is pretty bummed that he can't be here. He's still out of state doing his bat study over there, which he's actually enjoying. But he did say that he is going to unfortunately have to miss this episode. And so he has a little message that I kind of wanted to read to you, if that's OK. Go for it. All righty. So he says, I would first like to thank you for taking the time to join us. I apologize for not being able to join today, as it is regretful as I've been looking forward to this episode since hearing you would be joining. You've been an inspiration to me since I started the plunge into the world of fly fishing. Just as you have inspired me, I'm sure you've inspired many across the globe. What is your inspiration or someone you admired in fly fishing? Wow. We're getting right. First of all, can you please make sure that he knows that I'm thankful for that and that I hope that our paths cross in future. <laughs> I will make sure to let him know. Thank you. Um, you know, it's funny. When I got into fly fishing, there was no... I mean, I'm sure maybe the internet existed in a dark corner somewhere, but it certainly, <laughs> it wasn't widespread. There was no Facebook or social media. We, we couldn't find mm -hmm. each other. Um, so it's not like I really looked up to anybody in particular, except for the people that I was running into on the river. So a lot of the people that were really my, my initial inspirations, I don't know who they are. Um, you know, I just had, I, I, I remember the first time I saw it, there were these two guys and it was on the lower section of the Chilliwack River. It's called mm -hmm. the Better River. And it was a summer day and I was bait fishing, uh, or I think I was using just a little bit of yarn for salmon. And I stumbled across upon these guys fly fishing for salmon. And I'd never seen it before. And I just sat there watching them totally mesmerized. And those two people, whoever they were, they're the ones who started this whole disaster <laughs> of an obsessed fly fisher. <laughs> that is awesome. And yeah, we did just jump right into it. I just wanted to make sure I got that message out there before I forgot because oh, he is extremely yeah, I bummed it. I wasn't here. Um, but yeah, so it, would you mind giving a little bit of a background for some of our listeners that for some reason may not know who you are? Yeah, yeah, sure. My name uh, is April Vokey. I have been working professionally in fly fishing now for 20 years. Wow. And, oh, wow. um, got, got my start when I saw those guys, that was about 25 years ago and I see. was always a, a keen conventional gear angler. And when I had seen that, I knew that I needed to do that for a living, but I was, you know, waitressing. I think actually at the time I was busting table tables. I wasn't old enough to waitress yet. <laughs> you have to be 19 to waitress in, <laughs> in Canada or to serve in Canada. And, um, and yeah, so from there I knew that the only way I could do it every day was to guide and to guide you have to know your stuff. So I spent the next few years out there religiously, just getting to know the spots, getting to figure the fishery out, getting confident, stacking and accumulating gear, working nights to pay for the gear and uh, started at a tackle shop when I was quite young and ended up being approached by one of the major outfitters in the province who offered me a job guiding on the Fraser and Harrison rivers. And that's kind of where it all started. And then I guess in a nutshell, I did that for a little bit. And then in 2007, started my own outfitting company that was called Flygal Ventures. And then Flygal Ventures slowly morphed into uh, what we are today, which is anchored outdoors. 
uh, an, an online see. membership based around our, the podcast Anchored. So that's that's a really quick version of my career and history. That is awesome. So what was it that drew you to fly fishing when you saw those two guys out there on the river? Oh, it was just so romantic and slow and clean and elegant. And it was, like I said, it was a summer day. And I don't know if you've had a summer's day on the West coast of Canada. There's this real, like a, a smell in the breeze. And, you, you know, it was, I just kind of spit out from this big field of poplars and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was just, the whole thing was just magical. And, you know, I, I'd gone from the hustle and bustle, go, 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 go. I was always in a really big hurry. Cause I would start my shift at the restaurant. I think at that time, excuse me, I think I was working at the Olive Garden. I was either at Red Robin or the Olive Garden at that time. And it was always go, 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 start, start your work at four, shift at 430. And all of a sudden, just in that moment, everything just slowed down. All the, all the chaos just stopped. And, uh, yeah, I had to do that. Whatever they were doing, I wanted to do that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's exactly how I am. It just, my yeah. mind is the kind that just never shuts off. And so yes. every time that I'm out there fly fishing, it just seems like everything is so calm. It may not be. I may be on a river that's taking me out on my kayak and I may be freaking out, you know, externally like, oh, how am I going to manage this water? But at the same time, if I'm out there casting a fly rod, it's just everything's great. So I, I feel that absolutely. And oddly enough, I'm actually from Alaska, so I've never oh, been right. to the West coast of Canada, but I've been close enough. So I, I, I know what you mean by just the, I, I wouldn't consider it brisk, but almost brisk air of the summer up there is way different than the humidity down here in Arkansas and Texas where I grew up. <laughs> and I lived in Arkansas for a year. So I know for sure what you're talking about. And yes, there, I mean, Arkansas has got beautiful things about it as well for certain seasons but absolutely there's just nothing quite like the pacific northwest and that that breeze so you get it yes absolutely i do for sure but yeah i saw that you were recently here what was it last winter you're up in arkansas doing some duck hunting yeah this january we were there how was that awesome i love arkansas i think it's probably the most slept on state Oh, for sure. It's, I mean, it's the natural state, but people just kind of look over it. They don't, you know, realize how natural it is. I mean, there's just so much here and I live in hot springs, so I'm kind of central and I can drive three hours up north and be in the mountains and, you know, where it snows numerous times a year and, you know, trout waters, or I can, you know, stay out my backyard and catch some carp in this little mud hole, or I can drive <laughs> down south and be closer to Texas type weather. It's a, it's a, it's a great place, but I've actually never been duck hunting. I've lived here five years and I've never been duck hunting and it's something that I want to try, but I just haven't got around to do yet. So I'm hoping this year will be the year. I, I get that. Cause I don't know if duck hunting is necessarily the thing to sort of try, just try. You kind of need someone right. to, to go with you because it was, it's a huge commitment. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Yeah. It is. It's insane between the blinds and, you know, the, the spread of the decoys and, <laughs> uh, of course, the weather. I mean, you have to be tough to deal with the weather out there. And uh, I've been invited once previously, but haven't been yet. I'm hoping this year. Why didn't you go? I didn't didn't work out timing wise with my kids and all that. And I would have felt horrible taking my 14 and six year old. Well, they're probably 13 and five at the time, taking them out in, you know, 20 degree weather. To Don't tell me Possibly that. shoot some birds. <laughs> I, I dragged my daughter who was just barely six at the time out. And um, <laughs> I feel kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like my youngest would love it. I don't think my oldest would. I took her goose hunting this year for the first time. I didn't take the youngest, but I took the oldest and uh, she enjoyed it. But it was also somewhat warm outside and uh, we're shooting big birds. So it was a little yeah. different. Um, but were prior, there dogs? Like, for her first. No, the, sorry, we were actually just out there. Yeah, no, we were fine. We were just out there walking. Um, and we went up in it was kind of, you know, do you know where Jonesboro's at? I'm not sure. Up in kind I don't of think northeast so. Arkansas. So we were up in northeast Arkansas doing a conservation goose hunt, snow goose hunt. And uh, so we were just out there, just me, the girl that I was dating at the time, and then my oldest daughter. And uh, we were just going and walking them, getting them ourselves. Well, I was walking and getting them myself. And, you were the uh, retriever. It was, <laughs> yes, I was the retriever. It was tough. And we didn't get very many birds. Uh, we were shut up a little late for the group we were supposed to hunt with. And I think between eight of them, they got over 300 birds within oh my gosh. Like five minutes. Um, it was insane. They had a huge flock over there and we shut up probably a minute late. Like we were still pulling up to them when they, you know, blew the, blew the, the birds. So, um, they got quite a bit and then we got five. So <laughs> not nearly wow. as much, but we did get some geese and, uh, I cooked them up and it, it was good. It was a, it was a fun time for sure. Yeah. love it. So, but I'm, I'm hoping to get out there and do some, do some duck hunting this year, but we'll see what happens with that. So you talked a little bit about on how your career progressed 
At what point did you know that you wanted to make a career out of it? That day, that moment. Immediately. Immediately. That is awesome. My dad tells this story that I came home in a daze and mm -hmm. he said, what's wrong? And I said, I saw the most amazing thing today. I have to somehow find a way to do that every day. And that that's how awesome. it all started. Yeah. And so you said you went and you were working nights to pay for the equipment to get everything because you knew you wanted a guide. So you were just taking the steps, everything you could to try to gather everything up and get that going. Yeah. You know, I'd always worked night. I'd always worked restaurants. Uh, I mean, just to be fair, it was, it was a lot of money. I was able to go to school. I was able to pay my way through school with, with serving. Um, I enjoyed it and it let me have my days. And then I eventually ended up actually going in and, uh, waitressing at, at a casino, which was ideal because you could kind of make your own hours. And then I could choose the midnight till 6am shifts, or my favorite was 8.30 PM till 4.30 AM shifts. And you know, when you're young and 20, you don't need to sleep. Right. So just go from <laughs> one to the, the week other. At that point. Yeah. Right. You need sleep. <laughs> and it was expensive. I mean, my, I think, cause I remember I busted out my spinning gear quite early on in the, in the, my path. And then, um, I had my eyes set on a Shimano Calcutta. I don't know if uh -huh. you've heard of one of those, but I'm it was not, really, ex it was really expensive at the time. And, um, yeah, so. So I, I had my focus on that. The fly fishing gear, that didn't happen until later. I mean, I was, I was fully invested in conventional fishing before I ever stepped foot into fly fishing. I see. That makes sense. So is that how you started guiding with conventional gear and all that? Yeah, uh, well, actually, technically, yes. But I was a very much a, a, a fly angler by the time I started guiding. I started guiding for sturgeon on the Fraser River. So I ran a jet boat on the Fraser for sturgeon. Really? And then, yeah, then we do half salmon trips. So that was where I was, I really realized, okay, I love the fly fishing for salmon. I'm not so great with the sturgeon guiding thing. Um, I, I'd always loved sturgeon fishing, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Being a great sturgeon guide is actually quite a talent uh, that I didn't have. And then from there, I kind of, when I realized that I wanted to pick and choose my own packages. That's when I broke off and started my own guiding operation in 2007. I see. That makes sense. So sturgeon, that's one fish that I've always wanted to catch. Have you ever uh, caught one on the fly or was it only conventional? Oh, uh, no. So they're bait. They, it's a bait thing. You can't listen. You can. I have a friend who's done it. She soaked a fly in bait for a few days and then had some sort of crazy sinking line. And you technically could. Is it actually really fly fishing in the way that they are targeting a fly? Not really. They're just smelling out something stinky. I see. That makes sense. Yeah, I saw a yeah. video, uh, I guess it was a couple of years ago, of a guy that was fishing, I believe, the Cumberland River in Tennessee and okay. hooked a sturgeon at a dam on a crankbait. And so that was kind of the thing where I was like, I don't know how, and he didn't snag it. Surprisingly, it was, it was hooked in the mouth. Yeah, he pulled right. it out on the video. And, uh, so I was like, I wonder if people can catch him on, on fly. Cause every time I've seen any sturgeon caught, it's always been on some type of bait and that's a bucket list fish for me. And I'm mainly fly or die, but I'd probably go conventional to catch a sturgeon. <laughs> Look, I, I think that it depends on the clarity of the water and where I was, there I was definitely no clarity, but if it, I have heard crazy stories in, in clear rivers with smaller sturgeon, my mm -hmm. suggestion with all species of fish and very much sturgeon included is catch them on the easiest method possible at first to understand their behavior. And only yeah. then should you feel comfortable and educated enough to be able to start expanding into fly fishing. That definitely makes sense. I never thought about going about it that way. I normally just say, I'm going to catch it on a fly. And yeah, right. <laughs> that's kind of what I did with carp and koi and yeah, uh, good. Was, was strangely successful this year, but, uh, yeah, that's one thing where I did contemplate going and using bait and I just tell myself, no, you're not a bait angler. You're going to, you're going to catch it on the fly. <laughs> I'm just, I'm stubborn. So did you never fish bait? Did you not ever fish bait or conventional gear? <sighs> when I was younger, uh, we kind of did. I, my, my origin into fishing is, is strange. I've talked about it previously on the podcast, so I won't go too deep into it, but basically a homeless guy under a bridge in Austin, Texas gave me a fishing pole. <laughs> and so I just went out trying to catch a goldfish in a creek with some corn. And um, that kind of rolled into me being like a conventional angler, but it was never really much with bait. It was more of like a bass angler, you know, always using soft plastics or crank baits and buzz baits and spinner baits and whatever else. Um, not much bait, didn't do a lot of catfish fishing or anything like that. And then kind of had a phase where I didn't really do much in terms of fishing. I did a lot of kayak and a lot of hiking and stuff like that. And then 
uh, my co-host, Jose, actually got me on a fly rod for the first time. I think it was probably 2015. And um, I was out there with my bait caster and he was catching fish and I wasn't catching anything. And he said, hey, man, you know, try to catch something on this. I said, I don't know what to do with that thing. He said, just flip it out there. You'll catch something. And literally first cast hooked into about a 12 inch bass on a two weight glass rod and fought it and brought it in. And I was hooked at that point. And then moving to Arkansas, knowing that there was more trout water here um, and fly fishing was a little bit more accessible here. I said, oh, I'm definitely jumping into it. And I've been hooked you know, ever since. No pun intended. Yeah, right. No, I love it. <laughs> well, I should actually clarify then because let me, let me rephrase. Uh, yeah, no, I think I said catch it on the easiest method possible. When mm -hmm. at first, before you advance the next, you know, more difficult thing, because with carp and with trout, a lot of the times the easiest thing to catch them on is a fly. So don't go beating yourselves that, you know, yourself up trying desperately to catch it on a lure. If right. the reality is, if it's eating a sedge, if it's eating sedges, catch it on the sedge because mm -hmm. that's the easiest. Yeah. And then, you know, go on from there. Exactly. That definitely makes sense. Well, that's some uh, hot takes there for those listeners out there because, uh, yeah, I mean, there's some fish out there that obviously, you know, you can go buy a $15 Rapala and, and catch a bass all day. And that's one thing is I've had, I haven't had issues catching bass. I've had issues catching large bass on the fly. Oh, and uh, no. so that's something that I want to get a little bit better at. Um, I've caught, you know, large redfish down in Louisiana. I've caught, you know, 35 pound carp out my back door, um, all on the fly, but I just can't seem to narrow down the big bass. I, I think I've caught probably a four pound is maybe my biggest large mouth that I've caught on the fly. Um, right. and I'm trying to get to that, that to the double digit point, but, uh, it's, it's difficult. See, I've done, I've done some fishing with Oliver Nye. Who's a, I think he's a tournament guy at this point now, but he mm -hmm. specializes in big fish. And watching him fish conventional gear alongside me while I'm fishing the fly is just mm -hmm. so eye-opening. And seeing what he's doing different, and I got to be honest, not only is he able to get out farther, have his lure in the water longer, but he's mm -hmm. fishing baits that are enormous. And I think <laughs> that what he does is he ends up eliminating the little fish. Yeah. So maybe he's not on, on fish all day, but when he is on fish, he's on huge fish. So that watching him fish has been a real eye opener for me in my own bass angling and that not being sense. afraid to put on enormous, I mean, provided there's not a hatch, if they're feeding on a hatch, then everything is a different game. But if right. we're just focused on some sort of territorial attack, he fishes crankbaits or big, huge plastics that are this, like, literally, I don't know if people can see this, but they're the size of my face. They're huge, bigger than that. Um, and, and he does, he doesn't get any little ones. So maybe that's a trick. I don't know. We're thinking that might about. be, I I've actually used that on smallmouth before and I have yet to catch 20 inch smallmouth. Um, and we don't have, we have Northern smallmouth here, but, um, I'm normally, you know, fishing creeks and rivers. So they're typically interbred with the local species here of smallmouth. Um, whether it be, you know, the Washita smallmouth or the Neosho smallmouth, but, I have yet to catch a 20 inch smallmouth, but I do throw some six inch long flies when I'm out there. I have one specifically that I like. It's very similar to a game changer, but it has a double barrel popper head yeah. and it moves water like crazy and swims like a snake out the back. And I've caught some decent size, probably 16, 17 inch smallmouth on it. Um, but can't find the large mouth. <laughs> can you, can you experiment? And this is going to be crazy. I, and I have no idea if this is practical. <laughs> could you go bigger? Could you cast like a musky style fly, something huge and just see I possibly as an experiment? Could. what happens? I, I do have, I do have a, um, an articulated craft fur fly. That's probably closer to eight inches that I catch a uh, pickerel on here. And I've never tried to throw it for bass. Although bass do reside where pickle are pickerel are, but the sp spot that I go for pickerel is pretty much just filled with pickerel. So I've never tried to throw that fly and it's like yeah. fire tiger colored. So it probably, I, I need to try that. I will definitely try that. <laughs> Commit for a day and see what happens. I will for sure. My shoulder will be killing me, but it'll work. You will. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely have to try that. I appreciate that tip. So let me know. I'm curious. Yeah, I will definitely let you know. And so we can kind of go back in the past and dig into your past if that's okay. Um, go for it. So I saw that you were on Buccaneers and Bones. Ah, yes. Blast from the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going to the Bahamas to try to catch some bonefish. How did that trip come about? Whew. That's a good question. Patagonia. I was working with Patagonia mm -hmm. at the time. So Bill Klein, who is a head of marketing, had extended the invite. And obviously I knew Yvonne and, and so, yeah, it just kind of came. I think that's actually, that's exactly how it came about Patagonia. I have yeah. been to the Bahamas and I got to fish for about 30 minutes and it was actually the same place as that video, uh, Grand Bahama Island. Yeah. And, uh, 
unfortunately I wasn't on the boat. I was just, you know, walking the surf and, uh, the water was tough. It was so bad that they actually, I was on a cruise and they actually had to cancel like 400 excursions because the water quality was so bad. Like they oh, couldn't swim so? with the pigs. Uh, just, they said there was a, a low pressure hanging over the North area of the Bahamas and it was just causing, cause normally they said the tide came from the South and it was coming from the North or something like that. Uh, right. but the water was extremely murky, extremely choppy. And, um, like couldn't even swim with the pigs and they had to cancel some of the excursions going out, doing some other stuff throughout the islands. And, uh, so the water was not good, but I was like, I'm in the Bahamas. Like I have to at least have a fly in the water at least a few times. So, um, went out there to try to catch something. I mean, didn't see anything. The, the waves were coming in probably like, you know, a foot and a half, two foot and, uh, catching bones on the surf, unexperienced, never seen one in your life. Probably wasn't going to happen, but I tried and, uh, it was just enough to say I'm definitely going back specifically to try to chase bonefish and permit now. <laughs> oh, yeah. But wait, if they weren't letting people swim with the pigs, was that because of sharks? Were they afraid of sharks? No, it was because of the, of the tide. It, it was, was too, ridiculous. It was ripping? It was just or? way too, yeah, it was way too choppy. And so we went and we took this little boat to an island where they had pigs penned up and the pigs were staying out of the water because the waves were just coming in too fast. And right. It was just, they said that what they told us, they said the water quality is so bad. If the pigs aren't in the water, you probably don't want to be in the water. So, okay. Oh, good point. I'll trust yeah. you on that one. <laughs> yeah. So we got to walk around the beach with the pigs. So the swimming with the pigs didn't happen. Um, but yeah, so I'm definitely going to go back at some point and try to chase some bonefish. Good. So was that the first bonefish that you had ever caught? Oh no, no, no. I've been, I've been flats fishing before then. It's one of those things when you're a, Especially as I, as my career started to advance, I started to get into the industry because what happens is, remember this is pre social media, but at the time, if you wanted to be a professional or if you wanted to really be able to sell your services and have people book with you, you had to travel and speak and write for magazines and do tra right. trade shows. So my season was basically filled up between guiding. When guiding was over, I did the trade show season. I wrote articles all year long. And then um, spoke for clubs wherever I could. And then obviously part, part of that is getting your, your travel paid for. And so right. I was meeting all of these people, both in and out of the industry. So the invitation started to happen quite naturally. Um, I see. That makes so, sense. Yeah. So just it, as simple as, you know, fly fishing the saltwater in Florida to something a little more extreme like Belize and the Bahamas, it all just kind of happened organically with invitations and, and trading. There was a lot of trading off. Sorry, the sun's blasting through my window um <laughs> lots fun. of trading like i would take people steelhead fishing and then they would take me on their flats boats so it was it's kind of this unwritten rule i always get a chuckle whenever people comment hatefully on my social media if i'm with a guide come on you don't need why are you with a guide or it's like no it is a <laughs> first of all they're friends and second of all it's this unwritten code we i scratch yours you scratch mine it's a it's a trade right. so lots of trading goes on I see. That makes a lot more sense. So the first time that you hooked into a bonefish, what were your thoughts? Because that's like, what, the seventh fastest fish on the planet or something like that? Yeah. It, and it was in the Bahamas. Actually, my first bone was also in the Bahamas before Buccaneers of Bones. Just mm -hmm. I could not believe it. It was like a four pounder, or a little fish. And yeah. it absolutely schooled me. And I thought, OK, I get it. I understand. I totally get it. That's awesome. See, that's one thing is I was talking to a few people that had caught bonefish and they said that of like the bonefish, the rooster fish, the permit, that the bonefish is probably the easiest one to catch. Yeah. But they said that it's also one of the strongest. And once you hook it, like you got to hold on. And so I was, you know, getting my mind ready. I was like, oh, this is going to happen. And then when I saw the water, I said, well, maybe it'll happen. I doubt it'll happen. I'm blind casting in the surf. But it's one thing that I can only imagine because the biggest, well, probably the hardest fighting fish I've caught is I caught like a 54 inch bull red in Venice, Louisiana. And Good fish. it took me like 45 minutes to get this fish in and I would get it in and it would just start digging and then it would take off again. And it wore me out. I, I'm pretty sure I got tendonitis in my elbow from trying to bring that fish in. Um, but it was just an absolute blast. But comparing that, that's just like an Eeyore of a fish. You know, they're big. So of course it's going to fight, but just thinking of a fish that has the speed, like I couldn't meant like tuna, bonefish stuff like that i just i can't wait to get on one but i wouldn't even know what to expect just hang on and right. maybe <laughs> maybe start to run but yeah the thing is that, <laughs> yes they're easy but not the big ones the big ones are not easy and, and the yeah. milky water can come into can be 
played to your advantage too, right? If, if it's mm-hmm. muddy or milky water, it, it can be easier just to cast into a whole school of them and you'll almost definitely hook up. Where it gets tricky is when you have one or two really big ones cruising together. I'm talking double digits and mm-hmm. or close to, and it's clear water and you've got a sight fish and they're spooky and you've got to land that fly in just the right spot. They can see everything. Yeah. And, and then once you get that figured out, then you turn to permit and just watch your whole life get shattered because <laughs> they've got eyes this big and they can see everything. Right. Yeah. That's one of the guys. So uh, have you ever heard of the honey hole podcast out of uh, South Texas ish? So those guys, I was talking to Landon and, and he's the one that told me that, Oh, bone fisher. He's compared to permit. He caught his Which first Landon? a couple years back. Landon Rowlett. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah. And he, he was telling me that uh, the bonefish is easy compared to the permit once you get to that. And he said that the permit is a challenge. And so I was like, okay, well, if I see a black tail sticking out of the water, like I'm casting at it regardless, <laughs> but I'm, I'm hoping that probably in this next year, I'll, I'll make a trip. And then I have another friend of mine that went down to Columbia and caught, you know, Bayada and peacock bass and stuff. It's just like, oh, it's crazy how many fish are out there and how different it is from everything that I fish, you know, normally. Um, but speaking on just different species, I know that you've caught, you know, Dorado in Bolivia, the bonefish Bahamas, you've been New Zealand and Norway and catching salmon and and everything. Is there one species that you would consider to be your favorite to target? Ooh, um, it's always going to be steelhead just because of the psychological aspect. And I just want to say something because I will dive into that, but you as a carp angler, have already fine-tuned your bone fishing skills. I just want to let you know that the best practice for all bone fishing is carp fishing, especially if really? you're doing it. Yep. If you're sight fishing, the layout, everything, I could not think of a better recommendation than carp fishing for bones and bone fishing practice for permits. So you're way closer than you realize. Hmm. Um, as well, far as my encouraging, <laughs> yeah, you got, the, you got this. Don't stop. Um, but no steelhead, it will always be the fish because of just ha- my my upbringing with them there are way cooler fish there are way more badass fish there are way more rewarding fish but for me it's always going to be steelhead so this may be a stupid question i don't know northern fish too well isn't a steelhead like a sea run rainbow trout or something like that yep it's an anadromous fish it's go- it's born in the river goes to the ocean to get fat and goes back to the river that's awesome. And and is there much of a difference in terms of, you know, looking at them appearance wise from, you know, just a regular rainbow that stayed inland its whole life or what what are the differences? Well, it's about six times the size. Oh, okay. I mean, they, they get up to, <laughs> they, they get that you can get them over 30 pounds. I've never caught one that oh, wow. big, but I mean, a 20 pound steelhead is a big steelhead, but it's yeah. funny, you know, if you look, the studies have shown that not all steelhead actually do return to the ocean. Some Really? Some steelhead, the males, the females have to go back for their lipid count to get to gain fat. But some mm-hmm. males, if the water that they're in is prolific enough, they do not actually have to go back to the ocean. And so they will stay in the river. So you I may see. not even realize that you just caught a steelhead and it's hmm. it looks just like a trout. You cannot tell the difference. Really? That's interesting to me. I've, I mean, I've heard like, you know, in some videos that I watch that they'll kind of talk about it, but I never knew much about it. And so it's crazy to think that I may have actually caught a steelhead I was somewhere up in Alaska. <laughs> yeah. If you were in Alaska, maybe, I don't know if the rivers are prolific enough, but maybe. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I know I've caught some really strange looking kind of what made me ask that question is I've caught some strange looking rainbow trout up there in Alaska. Um, but those were in lakes. So I would assume that they probably mm. weren't. Um, yeah. but I'm talking, you know, super long, super skinny rainbow trout. I've never seen anything like it. Were they just, un- were they malnourished? Maybe. Maybe. Cause what'll happen in lakes, if there's too many then in a lake, then they just can't get big. That's why a lot of lakes encourage you to take them out of there when you catch them so that they can, they can actually get some size to them. I see. That makes sense. Yeah. It was, I mean, I've caught, you know, a bunch of small ones up in New Mexico and stuff like that running, you know, on the Cimarron river and whatnot. Um, and they just, they, the ones in Alaska just looked very strange to me. One in particular was probably 18 inches long and probably about as raw round as a kielbasa sausage. I mean, it was just a strange looking fish. I've never seen another one like it. Um, but it had the distinct rainbow markings and I was like, Hmm, what is this thing? Was so, it Celted I'm out? Sure. Had, had they been spawning? Uh, I wouldn't think so. Maybe it, it was July. So I wouldn't think so. Yeah. I don't know. That's interesting. 
I, yeah. I'm not sure. It was very strange. I might have to e I'll email you a picture of it so you can see it and maybe you might know anything about it. But yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a real strange looking trout that I caught up there. Right. So you said that your love is always going to be for steelhead. Is that did you do a lot of steelhead guiding? Is that kind of where you started after the salmon and sturgeon? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So when I started my own business, I knew what I wanted to fish for, obviously, and mm -hmm. started with started with winter steelhead. And then guiding for summer steelhead is not quite as easy as as guiding for winter steelhead. Do you know the difference between, between the two? No. So a winter run steelhead, basically we've got winter, spring, and summer run steelhead. But let's just make it real simple and say winter and summer fish. Winter run steelhead enter in the winter months. Summer run steelhead enter in the summer months. But winter run steelhead actually enter in a mature state, in a fully mature state. So they are full of milt and eggs, milt or eggs when they return. So because they just don't have the same amount of time as the immature fish, they typically dominate tributaries within 100 miles or so from the ocean. So that's why the rivers that you're fishing aren't necessarily that prolific because there isn't that much bug life. Um, they don't stay there for very long. So a lot of them will turn around and go back. The other thing is, is that, uh, the cold water slows their metabolism. So they're not as aggressive. So you see a lot of people fishing big bunny rabbit flies or things that are really going to be able to have lots of motion in slow water, heavy sink tips. Summer run fish enter in an immature state. So they can go up, they can go hundreds of miles away from the ocean. And then by the time that they're up there, um, obviously a lot of those inland streams have got much more bug life. They'll stay in there longer. They also get used to eating dry flies and stuff because they're in these real buggy streams, which is why for a lot I of see. summer run ang like, anglers like us, we fish dry flies for summer run steelhead. And then the mm -hmm. water increases their metabolism. So they're looking up, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really cool because mother nature has done this so that we basically have got steelhead 365 days a year, right? Factor in the fact that not all of them go back to the ocean. I mean, she's done a really good job of trying to protect these fish because God knows they desperately need help right now. Um, so to guide some around steelhead is, it means in the industry, let's just talk, get back to being a guide. It means that you have really got to, there's like a list this long of people who want to guide for some around steelhead. And because they're so special, you basically have to have special permits to guide in most of the really great rivers. And as an independent outfitter, I couldn't get any of those licenses. So I primarily guided for winter run steelhead. And then my brother-in-law and my sister actually were managing a lodge or they were working at a lodge on the Dean River and asked me to come in to try to help with bookings. And I just fell in love. So when I was offered the guiding position, I took that and was there for, I don't know, five, five years. And then the rest is kind of history. It just kind of branched out from there and I don't know how far you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we that. can go as far as you'd like to. <laughs> because it was, what happened was I was actually, I, I had always told myself I would guide for 10 years. I was never going to guide longer than 10 years just because for one, health. Two, I, I just, I knew that I wanted to do other things. Um, that always invested, invested early. So I had, did have a backup plan in case I had to. I wanted to guide, if I was going to guide past 10 years, I wanted it to be by choice. So anyway, it was year eight and I was standing on the Dean. And at this point, all my clients or all my guests were regulars. They don't want you step-by-stepping with them downstream. They, they, at this point now, five years in, they just want to say, Hey, what's up? Land my fish and make sure a grizzly bear doesn't eat me. Right. So I'm standing <laughs> on the bank, picking my ass, not literally that I wasn't actually doing that, but <laughs> like collecting rocks. I've actually, at that point I went back to school because I was so not bored, but secretly bored that I would just put these um, my curriculum in my, in my, I had a Patagonia jacket with a zipper here and I put my phone here and I'd listen to my college curriculum or my, my courses on my phone. And that was when I realized I really like this whole audio learning thing. I think that, um, I'm going to start a podcast and this was all happening at the time in 2014, we'd filmed our first, or I'd filmed my television show shorelines with April Vokey mm -hmm. and all of these great interviews I was doing were being left on the cutting floor. So it was all happening at the same time. And I thought, you know what? That's it. I'm going to finish my 10 year, years of guiding. I'm going to start a podcast and, um, and see where that takes me. And so that was really the next big step in my, um, in my timeline. I see. So speaking on the guiding thing, did I hear recently that you're going to go back to part-time guiding? Yeah. Yeah. I'm guiding again. Just not look. It's That's like awesome. Once every two weeks. I think if I lived in New Zealand, I was thinking about this the other day. If I lived in New Zealand, I would guide for real guide. I love it there. And that is very much a step-by-step. -step. 
fishery. Um, uh-huh. But I'm in Sydney, you know, seven months of the year. And so we don't have quite the same fisheries as New Zealand, but not far off in the snowy mountains and the blue mountains. That's awesome. So I don't know anything about the geography of, of Australia. So um, are you doing a lot of inland stream guide stuff? Or are you doing saltwater guide? What, what no. are, you, are you guiding on? Yeah, inland stream, the snowy and the blue mountains. Uh, the snowies are spectacular. They're a little farther out than the blue mountains. We've got great bass fishing here. Really? Yep. Nothing I'm that passionate about, but I am passionate about getting people into fly fishing. So I try to focus more on on getting anglers who are looking to learn. And if we catch a fish, it's a bonus because, you know, it's not like I've been so spoiled with 20 pound steelhead and even with New Zealand, you know, <laughs> 10 pound trout. <laughs> it's right. If, if you get a four pound trout in Australia, that's a really good fish. I see. And, and this probably be a stupid question. Snowy mountains, are are they snowy? Does yes. Does it get cold enough to? It's, really? Yeah, I know. It's so cool. I didn't know that. I don't feel silly. I didn't know that either when I first <laughs> came down here. Yes, and we were actually fishing them uh, last week, and you can really, see, so I did almost feel like I was back at home. And the fish there are huge. I'm talking 12, 13 pounds, huge. That's awesome. It's very much an introduced fishery, but it's you could see just the amazing landscape and the dusting of snow. It felt very Canada. That is awesome. And so, what species are, are all out in that area? Brown and rainbow trout, and then brown and rainbow. You, yeah, and then in certain rivers, if you keep going in the other direction, you'll get to trout uh, bass. That is so cool. Yeah, I, I would have never guessed that there would ever be, you know, snowy mountains in Australia. <laughs> it's so weird. And like one of the rivers that we've started that we're actually exploring to do more bass trips on, it feels exactly like the Bolivian Amazon, uh, Amazon rainforest. You could not really? tell the difference, even the sounds. Um, and that, cause that's the other thing is that, I don't, not the sounds, but in Australia, the cicada hatch mm-hmm. is just absolutely next level. So really? if you've got a cicada in your box, whether it's for trout or bass, because think about the, t- the climate and the temperature. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I could go on and on. Uh, uh, Australia has <laughs> got amazing fishing because nobody comes here for it. Everyone goes to New Zealand instead. Um, right. We've got in one day you can catch a giant trevally and then go for trout and then go inland to get a big Murray cod, which is a fish that goes up to 100 pounds that's only found in Australia. Really? Yeah. So that it's awesome. pretty special. Yeah. That's definitely going to be uh, going on my list of places to go for sure now. <laughs> yeah, it's a good spot. <laughs> I, I always wanted to go catch barramundi too. That's just one thing that just because I've eaten it and it tastes amazing. And I was like, I wonder what it'd be like. I didn't even know what the fish looked like. And I looked up. I said, oh, yeah, that definitely would be fun oh, to catch on the end of a they're <laughs> badass. But they are <laughs> crocodile so cool. city. Like if you go if you go barramundi fishing, just don't get out of the boat. I don't care really? if you've snagged on a log. I don't care if you're launching it, your boat. <laughs> do not. Even the boat launches have got big signs that say not to go past your ankles because there are crocodiles everywhere. Really? Well, that and the barramundi also live in saltwater too, right? So you can go get saltwater barramundi, which are, they're just incredible. But yeah, you don't just don't get out of the boat, whatever you do. Yeah, that is good to know. I uh, actually one time was fishing in Louisiana and um, ended up jumping off the boat in the swamp you know, trying to get a fish and the Ooh. guy, I'm, I didn't know I was inexperienced and the guy, <laughs> don't get off the boat. And he's like yelling at me. I jumped back on real quick. He's like, you do not jump off the boat when you're down here. I said, I'm sorry. You, you said catch a fish. <laughs> and so, those are, uh, those yeah. are alligators, right? Yeah. Yeah. Those are alligators. And so they're okay, uh, far so less take, aggressive and far smaller. Take that, yeah. Take that times four. <laughs> those saltwater yeah. crocodiles down here are so scary. I've never seen anything like, it. I mean, you can't even go pee over the edge of the boat. There was yeah. there, not that long ago, some <laughs> crocodile, cause they jumped straight up, right? This guy, these guys were yeah. fishing and this croc just dove straight up and tried to pluck one of them out of the boat. And you can see it took a big chunk of the seed out with it. It's just, That's they're insane. They're beast. So when, when we are collecting oysters way up North, like in the Kimberly, somebody mm-hmm. has to be getting oysters and the other person's full-time job is just standing there looking out for big salties. That's insane. I would hate to have that job. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty scary. Uh, the, everything's on your shoulders. And if, if something happens, it's all on you. That right. Would be, that would be tough. <laughs> I would probably be shaking the whole time. That's a big reptile for sure. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so you touched a little bit on you just like teaching people. And that's something that I've noticed on your channels. You have all these different masterclass things. So is that kind of mainly what your passion is for your YouTube channel now and having all these different masterclasses and different things going on? Yeah. Yes. No. Um, so the YouTube thing is 
Look, I mean, it's just, that's a part of marketing, to be honest. Obviously when I post my vlogs, that's my personal stuff that I'm sharing, but yeah. um, to be able to share the class chapters is obviously a way to be able to say, this is what we're up to. This is the latest class that's launched. If you'd like to, to come on board and become a member, but then obviously a lot of those class chapters are really handy for just teaching people. Um, I see areas, but yeah, the, as far as is the, the question is teaching why, where my passion is. Yes. And so that's what happened with anchored. So when I started anchored the podcast, it was a success and I loved it. And it's to this day, it's, it's the most fulfilling job I've ever had, right? I get to connect and be inspired by these amazing people and share their stories with other people. And I was on such a high that when people would email me and say, that was a great episode, but I really wish that I could see what so-and-so was saying or see their hands or understand what he meant by working with bamboo. I thought, okay, yeah. well, there's an opportunity here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this podcast and I'm going to create a visual side of it. And so from there, it just very quickly turned into master classes. And, um, and then see. the anchored podcast pivoted into the anchored membership. And that's where it's since stayed. And again, I'm just, I'm beyond fulfilled. I've got great members and great people, great community, great instructor. Everyone's just wonderful. It's been great. So teaching people, is that something where when you were a guide, that's it kind of fed that passion when you're doing that as well? Did you have very many, you know, because I know at the end of it, you said that you were having a lot of anglers that were basically your regulars. But when you first started, did you have a lot of beginners that you were having to teach the basics of fly fishing to? Yeah. And I was starting to grieve them. I was missing that. I mean, I got to, <laughs> by, by the end of my guiding time on the Dean, I was with spectacular anglers. I mean, some, a lot mm -hmm. of them are, are guides. A lot of them are outfitters or like, you know, well-traveled anglers. And um, I was missing the teaching side of things. So it was just, it was, it was inevitable. I'd eventually get back into teaching, but I'm only one woman. I can only teach so much. Right. And, and I'm, I'm still a, technically a young woman. I'm in, I'm 41 now, but yeah, I still have still lots young. to learn. Right. As well. And so I thought what was really cool about anchored outdoors is that I could team up with these professionals in various niches and hire mm -hmm. the best of the best. So, you know, we've hired Brian Chan, arguably the world leading chronomid specialist to do specific chronomid, a specific chronomid masterclass, teaming up with Kelly Gallup, um, on a, on a streamer fishing masterclass, Bob Clay, world renowned bamboo rod builder on a bamboo building masterclass. So it was really cool to be able to team up with all these professionals and share their knowledge. Uh, not just, not just one person's. Right. Yeah. And, and I've seen so many different things, uh, on the YouTube specifically on, um, different niches that are all very interesting to me. And I, I, I was watching, I want to say it was Kelly Gallup's one. And I started to actually apply it last time I went out fishing. Well, not oh, the last good. time, the time before is when I first started applying it. And, um, I had an absolute field day on the river Yay. and I caught like a four foot gar and I caught some smallmouth bass and some channel cats and some long eared sunfish, some red. I mean, I was catching everything. And a lot of that was actually going by what I watched from that video with, with Kelly Gallup. So, um, oh, good. thank you for that. First off, My pleasure. But it's, it's crazy. The amount of information that is in some of those. So, uh, if anybody's looking to subscribe or wondering where can they find all that information at, would it be on, on your website? Uh, yeah. And actually we've just created a free membership so you can go to anchor.doors.com and then the new one, I haven't launched it yet, but I'll tell you here. So it's anchor.doors.com and then forward slash premium dash insiders. Okay. Uh, and I can send you this link to share as well, but then yeah, it's just, the, it's the free side of things. And so the free membership is still super full of value. So it's got our interactive Q and a and fly tying nights, which are every month. It's got our, um, our four phase library, which is really cool. So you literally start at phase one first video and you work your way through this, this time or not this time, this roadmap. And then you quiz yourself at the end. If you want, you don't have to quiz yourself, but if you like mm -hmm. gamification, you can quiz yourself and then you get points. And so the website is rigged to give you $200 worth of points. So you get basically oh, wow. one. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And then you can spend that by whatever merchandise you want on the site. So we basically give away a ton of clothes on the website. Um, That's awesome. and yeah, and then it comes with a number of free master classes as well so that you can try it out. And if you like it and you want to dive deep, then of course you can subscribe or you can just stay in the community and be part of the community for free. Totally up to you. 
Awesome. Well, I'll definitely put those links in the description so that people can actually go to it. Um, yeah. I have another question here that Jose wanted me to ask you. And he said that he's sure there are a lot of people um, who have pondered the thought of entertaining the idea of being a guide. He says, I know that mm -hmm. I have. I actually watched the video you made on YouTube regarding this very subject, which is good, a great good. video. Uh, for those who may not have watched the video, but for some reason are listening to us dudes ramble, uh, that's his notes. <laughs> Thank you to our listeners, by the way. What are some quick things that you would share to those interested in guiding? That is a great question. I would strongly recommend everybody watch that video just because mm -hmm. uh, the backstory is I had created a five-part series on So You Want to Be a Fishing Guide. And I teamed up with myriad guides throughout the world, actually, not just the country. And we discussed all of the issues. And so I, I think the big ones that come to the top of my, it's been a few years, but the top of my mind would be, um, one, you need to know that guiding does not mean fishing. In fact, if you fish as a guide, which is almost exclusively a no, uh, you'll just get yourself in deep shit. Pardon mm -hmm. my French. You can leave that if you have to, but <laughs> you, there's no, no good comes from showing that you can catch the fish in, in 99.9% yeah. .9 of the scenarios Two, uh, financially. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that uh, there's in most cases, not really any insurance. It's, um, like I said, I was investing very early. I always had a backup plan. So definitely make sure that you have some sort of understanding. A lot of guys just live day by day to day. And that's great when you're 20, maybe 30. But as soon as you start getting a little bit older, it gets hard. Obviously having mm -hmm. a family is hard. Most guides have to chase the seasons. So they're constantly traveling. Uh, mm -hmm. it's really hard. And I, and, and it doesn't just go for the guys. It goes for me too. I had a hell of a time trying to lock down relationships. It was really hard. Yeah. Um, what else about guiding? Let me think. Can you think of off the top of your head? Obviously the fame and notoriety thing. Like don't, don't expect the fame and notoriety, you know, and then you Oh God, did I, thing, was that, so. part, was that part of my thing? Did I include fame and notoriety in my series? No. If, I don't if, think so. If Maybe. anybody gets into fishing for fame <laughs> and notoriety, you need a smack. I mean, there are right. just, there are such better self-respecting ways to get fame and notoriety. Um, then, then fishing. And, and the other thing is, you know, you need to remember that in a lot of cases, and I don't think I included this in that series, but the fisheries don't necessarily work forever. I've watched yeah. a lot of my steelhead coworkers be basically wiped out of their fisheries because the runs just aren't there or it's too controversial. And, yeah. um, or ethically, they just don't want to. There's a number of reasons why someone may choose not to fish a fishery. And mm -hmm. in that case, what do you do? You start fresh, you start over. And then what if you're, what if you are 50 and you're starting over? It's not, it's right. totally possible. And I hope that you do if that's the case, but there's just a lot to think about. There's a lot to think about. Absolutely. And of course, having a backup plan, like you said. Yeah. Having a backup plan is huge. And, and I don't know if I would recommend somebody start guiding. And, and I think about this often because I have a daughter like you who's six mm -hmm. and people say, Oh, do you want her to be like her mom? And do you want her to be a guy? No, <laughs> actually I don't want her to be a guide. I want her to obviously follow her heart, but I just feel like there may be wiser choices. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. I'm very similar with my daughter and you know, I, I try to steer her away from what I do because uh, I'm a wolf for one. I played semi pro semi pro football up until last year and I've just had nothing but a bunch of injuries. And she was saying she wanted to play football and I mean, she's adorable and she's extremely fast. So she'd probably be good at it. And she's not afraid of contact, but trying to talk her out of things that I do is difficult. Um, but yeah, I want her to yeah. follow her dreams and, and chase her heart. <laughs> and if I were a guide, I probably wouldn't want her to be a guide either. <laughs> yeah. And then it comes to, and then the question is, well, who would you recommend being a guide? Would it be a part-time guide? It, it's too specific. Are you yeah. there? Do you have a fishery at your, in your area where it's sustainable and that you can spend your days helping people just with the educational aspect? I mean, is it a yeah. stocked lake? That's going to be entirely different than something that's going to be like a wild steelhead fishery that's so dependent on returns. So right. if, if someone should get into guiding, it's, it, it, the answer is very simply, it depends. That is a good answer. <laughs> and to kind of Spin off of that, uh, Jose had another question and he said, what is a piece of advice that you would give a younger April Vokey? Ah, <laughs> say no. <laughs> and don't be afraid of looking like a diva. I was so afraid of being deemed 
remember, this is different. This is, and we're not going to go down the woman track because it's what day is. It's Wednesday morning and I'm fresh on coffee and I like to keep my mood <laughs> high. But, you know, being a woman 20 years ago was different then. And if yeah. you were difficult to work with, you were deemed a diva or crazy or difficult or whatever the hell they would say, right? And yeah. I was afraid to be that person. So I would say yes to things that I didn't necessarily want to when it came specifically to marketing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I let my image be used in a way that I didn't want to. Or if somebody took a photo uh, without asking me, because there were people, I've had people hide in bushes, professional photographers hide in bushes. Okay. One particular professional photographer <laughs> hide in a bush away from me to catch a fish. And then pop out and actually ended up selling that photo to a magazine cover. And I had zero legal right because I was in a public really? place at the time. Yeah. And it was a great photo. So I let it slide. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I should, there are a number of situations like that. And because the younger April Vokey didn't know that around the corner would be Facebook. See, I didn't know that. And I didn't know what yeah. the internet meant. I didn't know that it was forever. I didn't know I had le zero legal standing. I didn't know any of that. And so a lot of the stuff that had happened, with digital cameras before the internet really kicked off, um, I would have just very clearly said no um, yeah. and put my foot down because now I, I can't, once things are, anyway, I would have said no. Yeah. That is crazy to me though, to think that somebody was hiding in the bushes just waiting for you to catch trout. Smoke. I have seen everything. We, when we were guiding on the Dean, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, so I've got disgusting jokes. I am a horribly dirty human <laughs> and we will just and those jokes stay with friends at the table and so when we would shut down uh the dean we'd bring in friends and so obviously we brought in some friends they brought in a guy that we didn't know this should have been a red flag for me and mm -hmm. i because i was on my downtime had just totally relaxed that i'm telling these jokes and then i realized he had his phone like this. And he's videoing me telling, I mean, these are career ending jokes. I shouldn't be telling them to be honest. And now that I know what I know, I wouldn't tell them now, but, right. um, trying to video, like, why do you need to catch me in my private time with my friends, tell, you know, saying private conversation. So anyway, just stuff like right. that. Uh, and actually, and because I was not afraid of being a diva at that time, I just jumped across the table, grabbed the phone and deleted everything, you know, but <laughs> anyway, the point is, is that yes, it, it, times are different now when you could just kind of be yourself. So I would tell the younger April, the internet is real. The internet is not going anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Watch yourself. That's that guy has some stones though to sit there. I mean, especially if he was invited by other friends, like what, what would even go on in your mind to think that oh, that's okay to do? I'll tell you some of the people you run into out there. It's we got, we've got stories for days. We'll save them for another time. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, I guess we're kind of coming up close onto time. So I guess we can finish with another question that Jose had. It says, I imagine in your journey through life and your career, you've seen some beautiful sights and had incredible adventures and experiences. Are there any for better or for worse that really stick out or memories that you revisit often? Yes. And I would say that that's probably the, where I've been most fortunate in life besides meeting great people with, with the mm -hmm. podcast and, and the, and fishing has been the places that I've been. And, you know, you hear that so often the cliche, I love fly fishing because the beautiful places it brings me, but mm -hmm. that is truly why most of us love fly fishing. Exactly. Um, yes, I have a few that stick in my mind. Every single one steelhead fishing, just, I, I think for me, discovering steelhead as a young woman, you know, I was 16, 17, it was, it, I just really resonated. They really, I, I really, they related, I related to them mm -hmm. in that they were wild and that they were just trying to make their way. And I was really lost at the time. And there was just this, I'd be out there and the, all by myself in this bare inhabited place. And I would just feel like I was in alone. I felt like I had the steelhead. So any, any sort of river trip like that stands out. Um, Argentina not fishing just in the middle of the day they come in and they drink wine and and do lamb uh, like roast a lamb and then that was a real life-changing moment for me sitting there and realizing okay i don't need to be gut busting and constantly fishing i can just enjoy right now i'm in right now so that was kind of the first time that ever happened and then the big one for me is i remember sitting in iceland on a hill and overlooking just the whole fjord or whatever it is, the whole land of whatever the fields are and the beautiful river. And 
I had at the time been traveling a lot. That was kind of my job at that point. Uh, before everybody in the world was an influencer or, you know, going on these trips, I, I had some wonderful opportunities, but I remember sitting there being like, I am lonely. I don't, I've never felt like this before, but I'm going to all these wonderful places and I'm really lonely. And that was another first for me. And that's one of the reasons why I love being a mom, because I get to go back and do all these places and share it with my family. Right. And so it just adds a whole new element because I know that you can have it all and live the best life in the world. And from the outside looking in, everyone thinks that you are the most lucky, fortunate person. And you are in many ways. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you're still alone. So it's been really cool to be able to, to do it all again, but with people I love. That is awesome. And so I see that you and your husband's name is Charles, correct? Yes. Okay. And so y'all travel quite a bit together. Is he into fly fishing as much as you are? Yeah. So we actually met fly fishing. Really? He, uh, he doesn't go on all my travels because he's got a, a job in here in Australia. So he can't come with that. That's why Adelaide and I are constantly by ourselves. We leave again in... <laughs> 17 days on another wild one. We're going, where are we going? Awesome. We Canada, Northern BC, up near Alaska. And we've got Florida and we've got Montana. Yeah, it's going to be good. But he and I met in Norway really? on, a, on a fishing trip. Yeah, it, uh, we were supposed to, I'll save you the big romance, but we were staying at the same farmhouse and I walked outside and there was this man putting on his waders. And it was, it was actually love at first sight. Like for both of us, <laughs> the world, I'm not even kidding. It was like in a Hollywood movie, the whole world just stopped. And in Norway of all places. Yeah. So yes, he, he fly fishes. Norway is absolutely gorgeous. It doesn't get dark in Norway, right? In the summer when right. you're fishing for salmon. So we would just stay up all night fishing and getting to know each other. And it was, yeah, it was great. I love whenever you're that far up north and it doesn't get dark in the summertime because when I was up there last year in Alaska, I would put my yeah. kids down and I have pictures of me out there catching northern pike at you know one in the morning and it's still daylight right. out. And so it's awesome. It's tough to get the kids to go to sleep, obviously, when it's full sunlight out. Um, but once I got them down, you know, we're staying with my father up there. And so the kids would be there safe with, with their grandparents. And I would just go out with my brother and my brother-in-law. And we go around all these different places, different lakes, different rivers, and go out chasing trout and northern pike at midnight. It was awesome. <laughs> oh, that's so good. I, I, I hope that everybody gets to experience that at some point. Same. And it can, it, it can be Alaska. It can be northern BC in some places. It could be Iceland. It could be anywhere um, that has that. What, what makes it, this is a really dumb question on my part, but why, well, it must be some sort of proximity to the sun. What, why do some areas have that? I think it's the angle of the earth in relation to the sun. And so certain times a year, the earth, the, its axis will be facing the sun. So if you're here, even if you go to the dark side of the earth, I guess, you're still getting some of the sunlight. So, mm. um, I know up like the northernmost point of Alaska, I think they have like 20 something days where they don't see darkness, which is insane. Um, where I'm from in Fairbanks, uh, you have your summer solstice and then it's like 14 minutes the next day of, of darkness and stuff like that. And it goes up like that. Um, I couldn't even imagine 20 something days without seeing darkness. Like that would maybe go insane. And then in the wintertime, the complete opposite, 20 something days without seeing the sun <laughs> would be horrible. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a very good point. Very good point. So I guess we're kind of coming up close to the time. Is there any other thing that you want to talk about before we get ready to close this out? I don't think so. Uh, I appreciate the good conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you hopping on. I feel like it was a great episode and I learned more about you than, you know, from what I see in the videos. So that's always fun. And uh, I guess you plugged your website earlier, but would you mind saying it again so people know where to find you? Yeah. So anchoredoutdoors.com. Like I said, the free membership, I believe is anchoredoutdoors.com premium dash insiders, but just email me, just email me direct April at anchor.doors.com. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, I wish Jose could have been here to ask some more questions that he had, but I really do appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do it. Um, and I know getting up on a Wednesday morning, cause I know it's morning there for you right now. Um, so I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, it's been a very <laughs> casual, enjoyable, sunny morning. So thank you. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. And for those of y'all that made it to the end, thank y'all for watching at the end. We'll catch y'all next time. This has been wildlife outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.